pleasure to be with all of you and, and be joined by my colleagues who've done such tremendous work on something that is so critically important to the state of New Jersey. You know, this session, we made tremendous progress to make New Jersey more affordable. Historic property tax relief, expansion of child tax credits, prescription drug assistance, and record levels of school aid. Something else that affects New Jersey families at one time or another is the availability of affordable housing. For decades, our state has struggled to provide enough affordable housing options for residents. We've already allocated significant resources for housing this session, and now we turn, we truly turn, we'll truly turn a corner. In the legislature, we are moving forward with a comprehensive package of legislation designed to address some of the most stubborn obstacles to building more affordable housing. We've consulted with municipal leaders, with builders, lenders, and advocates to develop a, an approach that will increase the inventory of affordable housing and hopefully reduce the burdens and delays that all parties have faced for so long. I want to especially thank the sponsor of this, Assemblywoman Lopez, who's with us, and Senator Singleton for their work on this. The legislative package it will include incentives to build new housing, including tax relief, for purchases of building supplies and common sense ideas like rewarding sweat equity for residents who put it into their homes. These investments will pay dividends for generations to come. We'll also streamline the current system and find new ways to reach consensus on how to meet housing needs fairly uh, in the communities and throughout the state. Our cities, suburbs, and rural communities will have, uh, have all tried to reconcile this issue usually with sort of messy, costly legal battles uh, and confusing mandates as a result. We can do a lot better uh, working with the mayors and councils to meet our constitutional obligation and to help everyone uh, in each town thrive. Not to mention that everyday hardworking New Jersey families who are caught in the middle just hoping to find a place that's safe to move into can afford housing in the communities that they love. For almost 10 years, too much of New Jersey's housing policy has been left to courts without proper state guidance or support, therefore delaying substantive progress. The Council of Affordable Housing couldn't meet its obligations to ensure uh, access while uh, also balancing the needs of municipalities to, the plan, to plan for their future. But today that changes. Today, we're introducing a landmark bill that will abolish COA and streamline the process for municipalities. I'm very proud to, to partner with my district mate, as I said, Assemblywoman and our housing chair uh, committee, uh, Chairwoman Yvonne Lopez and Senator Singleton and hit the chairman uh, in the Senate. She's put in, Yvonne has, uh, and I'll say this uh, with all great respect to Troy, I'll let Senator Scatari say nice things about you, but uh, I've had the privilege of working now with Yvonne for six years and she put uh, in years working with all the stakeholders on this. She has a depth of knowledge uh, just as important to the issue, she's patient and determined. I'll now turn it over to my uh, my colleague, uh, Senator, Senate President Scatari, to say a few words. Senate President. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I didn't mute us, right? You can hear me. Uh, first, I do want to thank the sponsors, Assemblywoman Yvonne Lopez and Senator Troy Singleton. And more particularly, Senator Singleton's long been a champion of this very piece of legislation. He's put in a lot of time and effort. Uh, he, he enjoys the skills of a uh, staffer and the title of senator. So couldn't have a better person working on some complex pieces of legislation. It's long been something he's talked to me about uh, since he's been in leadership and even before. So I want to congratulate him and thank him for all the efforts in the very complicated uh, area of the law. And uh, I just want to echo a couple of the comments that the speaker made. Affordability has been the cornerstone of these past two years since I became Senate president and I joined the speaker in leadership uh, and also with our caucus. Affordability for the state of New Jersey has been on our number one, number two, and number three priorities for this year. And this goes along with that. Affordability for, for housing for folks that could, wouldn't otherwise afford it. We've already put our money where our mouth is, devoted more than $600 million dollars to affordable housing efforts in the most recent budgets. But I think most importantly that this bill will put together a mechanism that's functional. Uh, the Council on Affordable Housing uh, was challenged, didn't seem to work. The courts have now been leading this effort. Uh, and I think we're looking to marry those efforts into a, uh, into a process that's gonna work better for all those involved, municipalities, builders, and most importantly, the people that need places to live. Uh, through the efforts of uh, Senator Singleton and uh, 
and Assemblywoman Yvonne Lopez, I really appreciate the time and effort they put into this topic. Uh, because without their efforts, this would not be happening. So with that, I want to just say congratulations to Senator Singleton for everything he's done on this bill. Done a great job, Troy. And uh, look forward to working out the final details on this and, and getting it moving. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Senator President. Now let me, let's hear from uh, the sponsors of the bill, Assemblywoman Lopez. Thank you, Speaker, for that wonderful introduction. And you as well, Senate President Sotari. Thank you so much. You know, I'm glad to join you this morning to unveil what I believe will be the next step in helping address the affordability of our state. One of the very first hearings in the Housing Committee focused on affordable housing, and more specifically, the increased need for more affordable properties throughout New Jersey and for a more structured process ahead of the fourth round of municipal affordable housing obligations. Creating affordable housing is integral to the well-being and longevity of our residents. And in this endeavor, our municipal partners are incredibly important. Building upon the comments provided during that hearing, my staff and I worked on creating a process that learns from previous rounds and lays out a uniform, transparent, and efficient plan for municipalities to meet their fair share obligations. When discussing previous rounds, we know that the Council on Affordable Housing did not work. Although the current cordless system increased production, it has also resulted in a process that has been costly and lengthy for our municipal partners. Moving forward, this bill offers a clear and comprehensive pathway towards meeting our shared housing goals. Led and enforced by the Administrative Office of the Courts through the creation of, a, of an affordable housing dispute resolution program, as well as assigned county level um, housing judges, the bill creates a two-year timeline for municipalities with the goal of having all final fair share plans and housing elements adopted by January 31st of 2026. The process provides municipalities with clear timeframes to develop and settle both their municipal obligations and ultimate plans, while also providing other actors the opportunity to give input and address disagreements with the resolution. <clears throat> To avoid the debate that occurred in the prior rounds regarding methodology, the bill creates a consensus statutory formula based on the Jacobson decision for all parties to adhere to that will significantly improve the efficiency of the process and provide municipalities with a level of certainty about the size of their obligation. While the bill addresses much more, its goal of striking a balance between the needs of municipalities and the increased need for affordable housing production is clear. We cannot afford to create more confusion in the next round. And it is my hope with this legislation, we enter the fourth round with a clear plan of action. I believe the fourth round will be our most productive round, yet ensuring that every town meets its fair share and improves the lives of our residents. We want people to stay here in New Jersey. And with this process as a tool, we will create more affordable housing opportunities and increase affordability for all. I, I wanna thank everyone for being on, on this um, Zoom call today and Thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you, Senate President, for being part of this um, conversation. And I'll, I'll move it on to um, Senator um, Singleton. Good morning, all, and thank you, Yvonne, and, and this incredible uh, leadership team of uh, Senate President Skatari and Speaker Coughlin, who've uh, consistently and constantly uh, wanted to make affordability a hallmark of our legislative agenda here in Trenton. Uh, for far too many people, uh, the American dream of home ownership, which represents generational wealth, has been more fantasy than reality. Our objective here today is to bring that full circle so that everyone, no matter where they live, no matter where they come from, can find a home here in the state of New Jersey. It's something I've worked t diligently and tirelessly on in my career here in the legislature, and I'm grateful that my colleagues have remained steadfast and focused on this critical issue. The legislation we're introducing today, as Yvonne said, will codify years of legal precedence and ensure New Jersey's affordable housing system is insulated from changes in leadership or an effort to undermine equitable access. We've seen the success of this program since the court ruled in 20, 2015. And while we're still roughly 200,000 units short of the needed number of affordable uh, housing units, the state has doubled our supply in the last eight years, going from under 50,000 affordable units to nearly 100,000 units statewide. Clearly, the need remains high, but it is our hope that through this legislation and the holistic approach it represents, that we can begin to shrink that gap and in turn provide more affordable housing for all residents. The legislation we will introduce today looks at a regional approach and appointing special masters in the north, south, and central regions, ensuring they have an understanding of the unique needs of their areas. Most importantly, it will streamline the process by requiring the special master to determine regional need 
and calculate the obligation for each municipality. As Yvonne said, and I want to echo the work that she has put in as being a, lint, a, a helpful ear to sort of bring people together for this conversation. It's been instrumental in bringing us here today and in the continued partnership between the legislative majorities in the Assembly and Senate to ensure that we create this pathway to affordable housing. This will be far more efficient, this process, providing a number up front rather than the current practice where municipalities present a plan and then work collaboratively with organizations and the courts to determine if it meets their constitutional obligation. There are many barriers to the development of affordable housing. And while this will not address them all, it will make the process more streamlined and help towns to ensure that they are in compliance with the constitutional obligations established by the courts and ensure that New Jersey remains a great place for everyone to call home. Thank you. Thank you very much to our lawmakers. Uh, if we have members of the press who would like to ask a question, feel free. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for being with us. Appreciate it. Uh, we look forward to getting this important piece of legislation through uh, and making a real difference in people's lives. And we appreciate you all uh, for being with us this morning. Last chance, any questions? Hi, this is Ashley Balzer. Oh, we were close to a clean getaway. <laughs> um, I appreciate your time. Can you tell me what the timeline you guys think about this? Is this something you're trying to push through um, lame duck or will there be hearings on it so we can hear of what advocates and other stakeholders think? Um, and then an, uh, a related question in terms of affordability, Dan Munoz wants to know what you guys think about the 18 to $20 minimum wage increase that uh, Murphy mentioned last week. Would you support that? Thank you. So I guess I'll, I'll tell you, let's, Senator Assemblywoman, you want to, you want to chime in? Uh, we're, we're, we're introducing the, the legislation today. I think we're going to try, uh, we're, we're going to aggressively approach uh, the review of that. Uh, what if we can get it done in lame duck? Uh, I would get, I would get it done in lame duck because we want to make sure that the municipalities and everyone has a chance to uh, start to work on this process that you know it imposes uh, an obligation on the courts to, to establish those special uh, masters that uh, Senator Senator Singleton talked about. Uh, we want to get started as soon as we can, uh, and sooner rather than later. Uh, what I, actually, I have to confess you. I could barely hear the back end of the question, but I, I think it had to do with minimum wage. Yeah, uh, Dan Minos wants to know if you would support an eighteen or twenty dollar minimum wage that Murphy. Uh, had. I, yeah, I, my my sense of this is, and it, I'd, I'd like to stay on topic if we could uh, going forward. But the, uh, I saw uh, Governor Murphy's uh, quotes. I was proud to be part of the team that really pushed this. Uh, what the, brings us close to the top. Uh, in the nation in terms of minimum wage because ours is indexed up in some places a little ahead of us so they're a little bit ahead of us in terms of that but largely we have the, the top minimum wage in the in the nation i'm proud of the work that we did in that respect but we're always open to uh you know respect to what the governor has to say and take a we'll take a look at it. Uh, another follow-up uh, it's hard to ask questions on this and we don't see the bill and don't know all of the details on it but one of the issues um that that really popped up in past rounds is uh, segregation and and what regional contribution agreements had done. Are, are there any protections in this bill that would try to to make sure that we are not as segregated and that affordable housing is being built across the board and where it's needed? Uh, speaker, if it's all right with you, I'll chime in on that one. Uh, actually, that's a great question. And it's something um, from my history, having worked with our former speaker, uh, Joseph Roberts, when I was a staffer, when we banned regional contribution agreements, which I still believe was the right thing to do. And we'll carry that forward um, because we were trying that essential that system in large measure concentrated poverty in certain communities. And the work that the legislature did at that time uh, continue to do to this day is to ensure that we become a less segregated society. And I think with the special master system that we're developing, um, you're going to see a greater emphasis on ensuring that uh, discussions around segregation are at the forefront of how we actually uh, allocate our affordable housing units across the state. 
we know that there are uh, equal opportunity uh, communities, and we want to make sure that they look like uh, the true microcosm of our state, that everyone has an opportunity to live in those communities. Um, so the work that we're putting in in this legislation is essentially to provide a framework and a roadmap that will allow communities to ensure that, again, every community in our state uh, again, is a true mosaic of what New Jersey truly is. Um, we feel confident that the process that we laid out in this legislation will achieve that. Um, but we look forward to a healthy debate uh, amongst both our colleagues and, and interested stakeholders. Um, but I know I, I won't speak for Yvonne here, but I know her heart on this. I think we both are in the same place. We want to ensure that our state provides an opportunity for everyone to live uh, all throughout the state and not just concentrate um, poverty or, or lower economic opportunity in certain communities. Well, well said, I think, I think that speaks for all of us, uh, Senator. And I think there, there are no RCAs whatsoever in the, the bill. It's a, it's a failed uh, process and I don't, I don't see it being reincarnated. Right. Um, can I ask one more question if no one else does? Um, <laughs> sorry about well, we that. We have a four question limit now. No. <laughs> um, I, would you be able to talk to me a little bit about your confidence in this formula? I, again, I remember from previous rounds, you'd have some towns say, oh, we don't have an obligation. Um, so can you talk to me about the Jacobson ruling uh, for people who have like no idea what it is and, and how you think you can uh, stop towns for saying, oh, we're fine when really um, they don't have housing that people can afford there. Uh, actually, I'll, if that was for me, I'll just I'll just tell you this. I think the overwhelming majority of communities, if you look at the record um, that have been uh, seeing their obligations conducted under the Jacobson's uh, methodology, you will see it's a very minute uh, number of communities that have pushed back and been concerned about their own obligation. I think overwhelmingly the communities actually like direction. And thankfully to the work that the speaker and Yvonne and the assembly have did and, and working with uh, municipal leaders, assisting us with uh, municipal attorneys to provide us some additional color into that process. I think what you'll see here, the overwhelming majority of communities uh, will feel confident because there has been some predictability with the Jacobson's model since it was employed uh, now upwards about eight years ago. Um, so we feel pretty confident that we've developed something that will um, not cause that consternation amongst communities. Frankly, there may be one or two. Um, but that's probably for reasons not been known to us and not been known to what the mythology does. Um, it's probably other uh, reasons why some folks have issue with that. Um, but we feel pretty confident that the what we've laid out here will be uh, understood by the overwhelming majority of communities because it's what they live under right now and how they've been able to operate. So we feel pretty confident we have something in place that'll that'll alleviate those concerns. Let, let me commend the sponsors and, and staff who work so hard to talking to, as we, as we outlined in, in the past, Ashley, but with municipalities, with advocates, with uh, builders, with the, the folks who will uh, have to live with this process. The fundamental tenet is that this be fair, fair to everybody to achieve what I think will be the absolute best result. So we're confident as, as Senator Singer points out. Hey guys, uh, my name is Katie Moen. Uh, just a quick question. I know in the past we've seen a lot of developer lawsuits um, kind of raised against the municipality in response to affordable housing challenges. Is there anything in this legislation that would mitigate that potential going forward? Yeah, what, when a municipality is involved in the program and, and uh, uh, participating and, and doing it in a timely manner, those lawsuits are, 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 uh, are prohibited. Okay, great. Um, and would... Would this legislation have any influence on pending developer lawsuits? It's, that's a good question. I, um, I, no, I think the lawsuits that are already in, in place will stay in place. So sure, because they'll be they'll be based on. Remember, this is designed to address the fourth round, which uh, which goes into effect in July of of 2025. So what's already in court will will stay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I just had a quick question on when you expect this legislation to be able to fill the state's affordable housing needs. So Senator Singleton mentioned we're something like 200,000 units short. What's the timeline on getting those erected? Well, let's, Senator, I, I think, look, I think Nikita, I think it's 
this is the beginning of a process that we hope will take us to the conclusion. First, the, the special masters will identify the various regional needs and then we'll move forward. Uh, the program's going to take uh, a couple of years because of, remember the, the fourth round doesn't start until July of, of, uh, of 25. So uh, it'll take some time after that. I don't know that the, there's a specific end date. And Nikita, I would also add, I think the speaker and Senate president said that uh, in and of itself, there is no one silver bullet to affordable housing uh, production. But this leadership team, uh, the Democratic majority, has invested significant amounts of money in the affordable housing production fund. Um, while this will streamline the process around which um, affordable housing obligations are met, the investment has never waned. This leadership team has been consistent um, with providing those resources through the state budget and will continue to do so. I, I, I predict and feel strongly in saying that. So not one piece will lead us to close that gap. It's a myriad of a bunch of different things. But let's be very clear, we have been actively working and aggressively trying to reduce that number. And it's through the leadership of both the speaker and Senate president, um, along with partnership with the governor. And we've been able to do it. I've been proud to be a sponsor of many of those proposals. Um, but as frankly, is the leadership of our uh, three leaders here between the legislature and the executive branch in order for us to put that downward pressure on that number. And we've seen evidence that it's working. Understood. And I know no one likes budget questions in December, but... Uh, in terms of funding levels for those uh, housing obligations moving forward, do, do you have any expectations? Well, every budget speaks for itself, but to Senator Singleton's point, we've made enormous commitments to uh, increase the amount of money for uh, low and moderate income housing. There's $300 million in this year's budget, another $300 million for HMFA. Um, so the, 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 dem the record speaks, I think, for itself about the, the commitment uh, and we'll make that evaluation as we go forward. Is there a cost associated with this bill, like with, with the special masters you were talking about or any other sorts of uh, implementation costs? Yeah, I don't have the estimate, uh, Ashley, about the exact amount, but uh, yes, I mean, the, in order for the program to be successful, we're gonna have to give the AOC uh, uh, the, the resources to be able to go through and to provide the special masters and there's a dispute resolution process that get, gets involved with the program. I, you know, my, I, I, I recall in the conversation around it, it's something in the $15 million range is about where I think that that cost would be. Yes, Speaker, actually, you, you, you're correct. It, the money that you and the Senate President have authorized us to look at in this legislation is around $16 million between uh, work, as the Speaker said, for the Administrative Office of the Courts, as well as uh, the Dispute Resolution Program. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful holiday season. Thank you for being with us. And uh, thanks again to Assemblywoman Lopez, uh, Senator Singleton, for your phenomenal work in this project uh, on, on this legislation. Have a great Thank day. Happy New Year. Bye-bye.